guys and welcome to Brew Talk with Mr. Beers, episode 69, installment number one of the Advanced Education Series, the cycle of a yeast cell and yeast management. My name is Ashley, I'll be your host today uh, as we discuss the hero in beer, the little single-celled miracle that makes this all possible, yeast. All right guys, so let's jump right in. In order to understand yeast, its health, and its management and how it affects our beer, we must first understand how yeast lives out its life within our brew. First, we'll discuss the most obvious thing, which is of course, what is yeast? So you can see here, I have a handy dandy little illustration to talk about some of the more important parts of the yeast cell. Um, there are more parts than this in a yeast cell, but these are the ones that are most presently important. Um, so we can see here first, we can see the cell wall here on the outside. This provides protection and shape for the cell, but is also a valuable indicator of a yeast age and how many times it has actually reproduced via how many budding scars are on the surface. <clears throat> so next we have here um, the periplasm, which is going to be right in here. So you can see it. I don't know if you can see that. This is the location where enzymes and mannoproteins um, are created, and these provide some of the primary catalysts for the fermentation process itself. So next we'll look at the cell membrane, okay, which is going to be right in here. Now the cell membrane is responsible for selective transport. Um, the metabolism and communication also exist there, so you can almost compare this to a nervous system of sorts. Um, and then here we have the nucleus located inside the nuclear envelope here on the outside. This of course is where the cell holds its genetic information um, and all the materials that create future generations of daughter cells. So also very important is the blueprint, blueprint for future offspring. Then down here we have this little organelle called the vacuole. The vacuole um, is where your yeast cell breaks down proteins into their amino acid building blocks, basically working like tiny disassemblers. It's actually pretty cool. And then next we have, of course, the mitochondria, also very important. Um, this is responsible for functions such as respiration and ATP production. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, say that three times fast, which is the primary source of fuel for every living thing on earth. Animals, plants, you name it, we all use ATP. After that, we have, of course, the ribosomes, right here, these little dots, and then we have uh, ribosomes here, studded onto the endoplasmic reticulum. But those ribosomes, um, they are responsible for primarily for protein production. And then lastly, we see that ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is right here around the nuclear envelope and the nucleus. Um, we have the, the Golgi, which are also very important. Those are gonna be here, the Golgi bodies. And then we also have the vesicles. Now all of these um, organelles synergistically uh, handle the secretion of protein processing and trafficking. All right guys, we'll let you see that one more time. We'll go ahead and put that back up there. All right, so now that we um, understand what yeast is a little bit better and what its general um, structure is, we can kind of move on to the yeast that we use specifically in brewing. The yeast we use for brewing belongs to the class Saccharomyces, um, and we use two primary species from that class, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae and Saccharomyces pastorianus, which is formerly been known as Saccharomyces carlsbergenus, but we don't really call it that anymore. We stick with that pastorianus because it's more accurate. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what we know as ale and wheat yeast. Um, these yeasts are referred to as top fermenting yeast. 
And this yeast is typically associated with warmer fermentation temperatures compared to lager or bottom fermenting yeast, which would be that Saccharomyces pastorianus. Um, Saccharomyces pastorianus is what we know as that lager yeast, which is considered that colder bottom fermenting and is associated with those colder um, brewing temperatures. Obviously, the difference is important due to the different fermentation characteristics and requirements. You can see um, pretty clearly how they differ when you look at them microscopically. Um, you can see that there is a pretty fundamental difference in how the two um, species group together. And also they do have a slightly different cellular shape. So they do look a bit different um, under the microscope. Um, depending on what you're using, you're going to have to make considerations environmentally um, about these specific species because they have different needs, which we'll kind of get into a little bit more later. Um, but based on how you treat them uh, within their species parameters, it can definitely have a massive effect on the result of your brew. So it's very important also to keep in mind that yeast is indeed a living organism. I think it's easy sometimes to downplay that because it's a dry powder and it isn't really sentient, but it is very much living. It does have requirements and just like you and I, if it's put in an environment that creates stress, it is not going to be as successful throughout its life. <clears throat> so yeast has needs just like you and me. Now that we understand the basic concept of yeast a little better and what it is, let's talk about its life cycle. And as we discuss that and move through it, I'll talk about some points of yeast health and yeast management that apply to those particular stages. In this talk, we'll mostly be discussing yeast in terms of um, dry yeast, but everything here for the most part will apply to hydrated um, starters, as well with some maybe subtle nuances. Um, let's start with where your yeast meets your wort, which is the pitch. When your yeast is first pitched into your wort, it enters something called the lag phase, L-A-G, just like lagging behind. This is when your yeast is acclimating to its environment. This period typically lasts anywhere from three to 15 hours respectively. Of course, this can vary strain to strain, just depending on certain variables. During this time, your yeast cell begins to uptake essential minerals and amino acids that it will later use as protein building blocks. Whatever the yeast can't get from the wort, it will attempt to manufacture itself. As like any other living organism, yeast needs a full spectrum of nutrients in order to be vital, healthy, and to perform alcoholic fermentation. As the nutritional yeast needs of the yeast are met during the lag phase, our yeast begins to manufacture necessary enzymes. This is again a very critical step in the acclimation or lag process. Oxygen is also an extremely important part of this period as yeasts really require good oxygenation and good aeration of the wort in order to stabilize their cell walls and become strong and vital for the future. <clears throat> Having yeast with better vitality and viability means that you will ultimately yield cleaner tasting beer. So very important um, for the long run. And that's brewing in general is all about the long game, especially with yeast, because what you do early on can affect you later. Um, so let's take a moment to talk about why the lag phase is important and when it comes to the entire process of fermentation. So again, the long game. During the initial hydration, if you're pitching dry yeast or even making a, an initial hydrated starter, you lose an average viability of 30 to 50%. And that is just on the pitch alone. And that's really in ideal condition. So it can actually be higher than that if your yeast is um, in bad shape, more than likely because it's old, expired, uh, past this ideal date or hasn't been stored in an environment that is conducive to maintaining its uh, viability. So all things that are um, important to consider um, 
or if your pitch is too small, your wart is poorly oxygenated, um, we can have problems later on, just all from having inconsistencies or inefficiencies in that lag phase. If you're working with a low number of viable cells during lag, during that acclimation period, your wart does not contain the required nutrients, vitamins, and oxygen, the yeast can struggle a lot to move through this phase and into exponential growth, which is log, which we'll discuss in a minute. This is because the yeast is, is under stress and stress yeast typically takes longer to begin um, budding or making copies of itself. And it can also impede um, that lag phase in general if your wart is too cold. So temperature is also a very important um, consideration within this phase. Our goal when we brew is to move through that lag phase um, successfully with adequate nutrient uptake so that we can maintain as many of those viable, healthy, undamaged mother cells um, so our, our yeast can produce the adequate number of daughter cells later to follow the brew um, through to the end. So if you have a lot of cells dying off and you don't have enough um, offspring being produced, then you're gonna have a higher incidence of stalls and issues with getting your fermentation fully completed without having a bunch of problems. Um, so very, very important. Um, I'm of the opinion, um, and so are many other brewers, that having an adequate number of initial cells, so meaning having a pitch that has the appropriate amount of cells, um, is even more critically important if you're going to be naturally carbonating and conditioning your beer, um, either in a keg or in a bottle, as opposed to force carbonating it because those yeast cells really have to do much more work throughout the whole process. So you want to make sure that that initial pitch that you have is good, strong, and viable, and that the environment that you pitched it into is also as ideal as it can be. <clears throat> if our yeast pitch is too small or has a low viability due to the prior mentioned factors, it can also do another thing that's pretty unpleasant. Um, it can give wild bacteria and pathogens opportunities to become dominant organisms. Um, and this basically sets you up for failure kind of right out of the gate. Um, essentially, by having these low viability pitches or having a lag phase that is not healthy and conducive to the yeast health, um, then you're basically leaving a big door open. If your yeast cells are damaged or stressed during lag, your production of off flavors um, is also going to be potentially much higher, um, which can follow you all the way to your bottling or kegging process. Um, so what do we do about this as far as yeast management is concerned? Um, as a brewer, one of the first things that I always do is I consider my pitch rate, followed by the initial parameters of my starting wort. So, making sure that um, the temperature is correct, the level of oxygenation, meaning it's been well aerated, is correct, and the wort has the appropriate nutrient profile. These are all very, very important critical factors when you're starting your brew. As far as pitching is concerned, keep in mind, home in home brewing, it is difficult to truly over pitch to a detriment. It is really difficult to do and very cost prohibitive. So I usually advise people not to worry too much about over pitching. Um, so if you're getting off flavors routinely in your beers and you've made every other consideration to the process, you may want to look at your pitch size because chances are that's got something to do with it. Um, especially if you're struggling with temperature management um, or lag times seem to be longer than that 15 hour window for you. It's important to note that while very long lag times, meaning you know, you've got a lag time of two days, is not necessarily ideal. Um, neither is the opposite in all cases. Um, because this is a critical acclimation stage, we want to make sure that the yeast has enough time to acclimate properly, 
build strong cells and uptake everything that it needs to be healthy. An hour long lag might be really exciting um, and, and very reassuring, but precocious yeast more often than not tends to be unhappier and less healthy in the long run. So we're kind of shooting for the middle of that. Um, and of course there can be exceptions to everything. Yeast, again, it's a living organism. So depending on it specifically, the strain you have, you can have some variances. So it's important to, before you use a yeast, to kind of understand the properties of that yeast and its characteristics as an individual. You can kind of think of that lag phase as formative. So it's important that you set yourself up for success. So if you were to compare the lag phase to something, it's almost like you, know, you have an infant or even a toddler. There's all kinds of things being built. There's all kinds of, you're, you're setting it up for the future. So you want to set it up well. I cannot stress enough the importance of aerating your wart properly. It is so critically important to make sure that that starting wart contains ample oxygen before pitching. Um, I mention this because in my experience, um, talking to so many brewers, home brewers, and professional brewers as well outside of Mr. Beer, um, that this is one of the most common reasons for high unwanted ester production um, later on. Uh, that and also under pitching, so under pitching and under aeration. Those are the two main reasons that I find people tend to struggle um, with their off flavors. Again, these are of course not the only negative possible variables, but they are the most common in my experience, especially as it applies to extract and partial mash brewers. Also, when it comes to yeast, yeast loves all malt wort. It loves it. It gives it a full spectrum of nutrition. And some of the examples of the nutrients that it provides are riboflavin, uh, inositol, biotin, and then also important minerals like phosphorus, sulfur, copper, iron, zinc, potassium, and sodium. So if you're brewing a wort that has a high amount of adjuncts, like um, say corn sugar or cane sugar, these um, sugars tend to lack the, the needed uh, appropriate nutrient content for a yeast cell, um, leading to oftentimes a lot of stress and off flavor production. Uh, therefore, beverages fermented this way with simple sugars like cane or corn sugar, um, are often dosed with extraneous nutrients to offset that um, nutrient stress, which is very important. So now that we've covered the lag phase, let's talk about the yeast as it trans transitions into log, otherwise known as the exponential growth phase. This phase can last anywhere between one and four days this is the phase where we usually visually see fermentation start to take off and most notably we see that croissant layer, that layer of foam that rises. As the yeast comes out of the lag phase, it starts to consume those sugars that are in the solution and large amounts of CO2 are then produced. The term log actually stands for logarithmic because the yeast is increasing its activity and rapidly budding, creating exact copies of itself called daughter cells. This is a form of vegetative growth and it is known as a sexual and ideal when it comes to brewing. It allows the mother cell's nucleus to actually split and provide that daughter bud an exact copy of its DNA, which is very important. Under really stressful conditions, um, you can actually have yeast grow sexual reproductive organs and they then can mate with each other. This is problematic because they create offspring that have mixed genetic profiles, which can kind of skew our intended result and produce um, flavors that we were not originally anticipating or after. So yeah, very problematic. 
The yeast um, in this phase quickly and aggressively um, consumes the wort sugars and begins to convert them into ethanol and other compounds. <clears throat> Um, this is usually the time when you see large amounts of turbulence. If you've ever stuck a flashlight down by your fermenter, you may have noticed that it almost appears um, that someone is stirring the wort, and that is actually the turbulence being caused um, by the metabolic action of the yeast. It's occurring now on a visible level. The exponential growth phase is made possible by the rapid consumption of those wort sugars. It's important to note that wort sugar is consumed by yeast in a particular pattern, okay? Uh, glucose is used first, then fructose, and then sucrose. These are simple sugars that can quickly be shuttled into the cell and give it a quick burst of energy. The glucose concentration in most worts, of course there can be variability, is about 14% of the total wort sugars. Um, next, the yeast will go after more complex um, carbohydrates. Next would be maltose. Now, maltose is probably one of the more important wort sugars of the whole shoot and match because it comprises more than half of your total wort sugars. Um, maltose is an incredibly important contributor to flavor. Um, it, it's what gives your beer perceptible grist notes and even influences the, the flavors that the yeast will contribute as well. Maltose is important also because it has the ability to turn on five different genes found within the yeast cell's DNA. This is basically what sends the message um, to the yeast cell that it's time to start fermenting. Maltose is taken up into the cell via a transport mechanism. Since maltose is a more complex disaccharide, it is taken up by something called, and this is a mouthful, a proton coupled symport mechanism. This is more labor intensive for the yeast, but this is where your yeast is really going to get its fermenting power. The monosaccharides that your yeast used first, like glucose and fructose, those are transported much more simply and with less effort through something called facilitated diffusion. After the maltose has been taken in, it is converted into glucose using maltase enzymes. After this process, the yeast is now, um, now has fermentable glucose to actually eat and convert into the prized ethanol. Lastly, your yeast moves in, moves on to the trickiest sugar called maltotriose. It's important to remember that some yeasts are better at fermenting this carbohydrate than others, um, and some can't ferment it at all. The ability of a strain to ferment maltotriose is actually what contributes to its individual attenuation range. And when we talk about attenuation, we are basically referring to how fully a yeast will ferment the available malt sugars within our wort, and more importantly, uh, the, that maltotriose. You may hear some yeast described as very dry. This is referring to uh, their high attenuation potential. So let's discuss some important yeast management parameters um, to consider during the log phase before we move on. As we have mentioned, log is the most active stage of fermentation. It's where the yeast is getting its high intensity workout portion of the whole process. Um, and they're at the height of their metabolic activity. Because of this, you may notice that your yeast generates quite a lot of heat during this phase. Because of this added heat, um, some home brewers can benefit, depending on the yeast that you're, they're using, from bringing that fermentation um, temperature down a little bit to sort of offset that excessive heat production, which again can contribute to a higher incidence of undesirable esters. Um, there's another important thing that you'll hear kind of brought up many times, 
uh, surprise, surprise, pitch rate is very important in this as well. Um, with adequate, so starting with an adequate pitch means that your yeast has to basically grow less. So we do want some yeast growth, but we don't want too much of it because then that can cause those production of off flavors as well. Um, so we want to, the yeast to grow less, put a little bit less stress on everything to get the job done and helping to maintain the integrity of those flavors. So again, that yeast pitch rate, not only is it important in lag, but it's very important in log as well. All right, guys, are you still with me? Good. Now let's move on to the final stage of the fermentation process. Enter the stationary phase. This can be anywhere from three to 10 days, depending on your yeast, but in most cases with uh, typical brewing yeast, it'll be about in that window. Um, of course, there are exceptions with you know, fast fermenting yeast such as Quebec, that can definitely change that chronology a little bit, but basically that's what you're looking at. Um, at this point, the yeast growth slows down, okay? Hence the stationary phase. Uh, as the yeast enter that stationary phase of growth, most of the flavor and aroma compounds have been produced at this point. Um, and keep in mind that yeast through fermentation produce, oh, produces over 500 different compounds. So it's quite a lot. Um, so most of those have been produced, including those fusel alcohols, esters, and sulfur compounds. Um, the beer is referred to in this stage as green because it generally doesn't have the appropriate balance of acceptable flavors. <clears throat> if you have brewed a batch or two, you've probably noticed that your beer tastes different prior to conditioning compared to after. And usually this is where people, if they're tasting kind of early, they start to notice off flavors such as green apple or in some cases even butter. Um, those flavors can be the most apparent at this stage. It's usually for people that have not experienced them before, it can be a bit of a point of panic <laughs> and rightfully so because they can be um, pretty unpleasant. So usually you're going to get more of those flavors as we discussed earlier if your yeast is stressed. So again, this comes down to environmental parameters as well as that initial yeast pitch. So how many cells were in your original um, yeast addition at the beginning of the start of fermentation. Okay. We mature and condition beer in the aforementioned stationary phase. At this point, your Kreuzen layer has fallen um, and the yeast begins to flocculate, meaning it's falling down. It's not as active anymore. Um, this is the time where yeast really start to clean up after themselves because they've pretty much exhausted all the available carbohydrates and all that's left um, at this point for them to reuptake is their own outputs. So, and, and during this time, they tend to intracellularly reduce those outputs into their more desirable, less offensive reductive chemicals. A very notable compound that is reduced during this phase is a ketone called dicetyl. So let's talk about dicetyl for a moment. There's a lot to talk about. Dicetyl is a byproduct of yeast. They all produce it to certain varying degrees and it's almost always considered an off flavor. Um, with some very particular exceptions, one of them most notably being the ESB style. So you can have some Dicetyl in those that is not considered off, it's actually considered um, a feature of the style. But in most cases, dicetyl is not desirable. Dicetyl is characterized by a butterscotch or buttered popcorn flavor in your beer. Um, the flavor threshold for dicetyl in homebrewed beer is a bit higher than it is for commercial beer. In the homebrewed beer, it's about 0 0.05 um, parts per million to one part per million, um, but some palates can detect it even at the most minute levels, myself included. Um, I have a very keen palate for dicetyl, so my threshold is actually quite a bit lower than that. 
Dicetyl can become noticeable in your beer when one of the precursors within the yeast cell called acetolactate is leaked from the yeast cell instead of being converted to valine within the cell. The dicetyl that is leaked into your beer can be reduced during the stationary phase of fermentation. The yeast reabsorbs the ketone and uses enzymes to break it back down into its reductive compounds and less offensive chemicals called acetoin and butanediol. So what do you do if you find yourself with a beer full of dicetyl during the stationary phase? Well, don't freak out too much because we can usually fix it. You've probably heard the term at one point or another, dicetyl rest. Um, the concept is pretty simple. Basically, dicetyl reduction slows way down at cooler temps. So towards the end of your brew, um, or if you're brewing a lager, then that dicetyl production or that dicetyl um, uh, where it actually comes out and is detectable is going to be a, a lot more noticeable. Um, this is why it's usually more of an issue with like cold fermented lager style beers, but it can also be found in high amounts um, in heavily dry hopped ales as well. In these cases, we employ a dicetyl rest to reduce that. For lagers, we usually raise the temperature um, to 65 to 68 for the last two or so days of the fermentation, more specifically about two to five gravity points away from our target terminal gravity. So almost done, but not quite. For our ales, uh, the reduction of dicetyl is similar. Of course, that temperature range can, range can be a little different since ales typically ferment uh, warmer than lagers anyway. So usually, you, if you're brewing um, or you're fermenting your ale yeast at say 70, you may only need to bring that rest temperature up a degree or two, or possibly not even at all if you're already brewing at a temperature such as that you just may need a little bit of that extra time. Here we can see a general depiction of the expression of dicetyl and the beginning of its reduction. It's worth noting that dicetyl can also be caused by bacterial infection, usually either by um, Pediococcus or Lactobacillus bacteria. This is a whole subject on its own that I won't get into because we could make an entirely different um, lecture off of it. But just know that if you're having a hard time reducing your dicetyl with the rest, that you may actually have a bacterial component to that. So let's go back to that green apple flavor that we mentioned earlier. What chemical causes that? The culprit is acildehyde. Brewing yeast produces acildehyde as an intermediate compound during the conversion of glucose to alcohol. So it's basically a precursor. This chemical is produced in every beer, usually during the earlier fermentation stages. In a healthy fermentation, the yeast is generally able to convert the majority of that acildehyde um, back into alcohol but if you have factors like we had mentioned earlier um, in the early parts of your fermentation process, uh, like under pitching, poor aeration, or even um, overexposure to oxygen after the beer has reached the final gravity, um, your acetaldehyde will fail to fully convert to alcohol and boy, will you taste it. <laughs> Speaking of oxygen exposure, this can become even more complex if that exposure, um, your beer is also exposed to aerobic bacteria. And those bacteria can convert that acetaldehyde into acetic acid, which you guessed it, tastes like vinegar, which is pretty gross. <laughs> acetaldehyde is, in my opinion, the most common indicator um, of a stressful fermentation and the number one cause uh, for most home brewers encountering it in high levels um, that I see is ultimately under pitching or um, untimely exposure to oxygen or poor aeration of the wort early on. So those are kind of the most common reasons that I see it occur. 
So are you starting to notice a pattern with pitch rate yet? <laughs> As you can see, it's pretty important. What do we do if we are beyond that point and we can't go back to the beginning? The answer is usually time and conditioning. That's where natural conditioning and carbonating can come in very handy and also one of the reasons why most home brewers do tend to bottle condition their beer. If you have completed fermentation, meaning that there's no longer act, um, gravity drops in your beer, bottling it and adding priming sugar acts to wake the yeast up and send them back to work. So not only will they have the ability to consume some additional sugars and create your CO2, which lends you your carbonation, but they will also have an opportunity to reabsorb and reduce those undesirable compounds. Speaking of our LBK for a moment, since many of the people watching this are probably using one, it can be very tempting to leave the beer in the fermenter for an additional amount of time beyond uh, completed fermentation, thinking that these flavors are going to clean up. And you're not entirely wrong in that thinking, but you're kind of overlooking a critical factor. So over oxygenation encourages the expression of acetaldehyde. If your ending SG has been reached, there's not enough CO2 being produced in the fermenter to push oxygen away from your beer. You'll hear me talk about positive pressure a lot and how important it is to preventing your beer from becoming unwantedly over oxygenated in the stages that you don't want it to. By continuing to your bottling, uh, once your specific gravity has been reached, you are basically leaving the beer to condition in a far more controlled environment. So you're stopping that um, extraneous oxygen exposure and now you have your beer in a very controlled um, environment to continue to condition and clean up after itself. Um, now, of course, this can apply to other fermenters too. It's not just the LBK. Um, you can even have this occur in traditional carboys that have a bung and airlock system. Um, those aren't necessarily airtight, and if you have a large amount of headspace, then you can end up with the same result. So, important things to remember. As I touched on earlier, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because a lack of good aeration in the beginning, so basically lack of good oxygen at the um, lag phase is problematic and can bring out acetaldehyde and other unwanted esters. But if your beer, once it's fermented, is overexposed to oxygen, then we're now exacerbating that problem even more. So a rule of thumb that I always keep and have for years is that oxygen is good for wort. It is bad for beer. So keep that in mind. Oxygen, wort, good. Beer, oxygen, very bad. Can also be helpful to condition your bottles at a warm enough temperature, at least initially, so that your yeast is able to work uh, quickly and efficiently through conditioning. Because um, cold, too cold, and inversely also too hot, um, can put more stress on these already tired, scarred yeast cells. So it's important that you know you keep all these things in mind because you can further complicate uh, that green apple flavor problem. All right, guys. So let's go over some of what we have learned today or discussed. I think it's become pretty clear that proper yeast management from the very beginning to the very end is tantamount to being a successful brewer and making successful tasty beer. Some of the most critical factors I think that we've discussed are yeast pitch rate, temperature, and of course, wort quality, meaning nutrients, aeration, minerals, all that good stuff. You can think of a yeast pitch like a construction crew. So basically the more healthy, viable workers that are on that crew, the better and faster the job can be completed with um, a higher standard of quality. If we provide yeast with enough environmental support um, through proper temperature, mineral nutrient base, and aeration, 
those incredible little cells will really pay you dividends. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I hope it helped to enrich your knowledge and your understanding of yeast, its life cycle, and its contribution to your overall finished product. Um, this is not everything that you could learn about yeast, not by a long shot, but I hope that it at least gives you um, extra food for thought and encourages you to do some of your own research and acquire your own knowledge as well. Um, thank you so much for nerding out with me. Uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. I absolutely love yeast and I hope that you come back and join us for um, another episode next week of Brew Talk with Mr. Beer. I believe it is episode 70 and it'll be again with Robert. Um, if you guys would like to see these again, these advanced talks, please let us know. I'm sure I'll get better at them the longer that I do them. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of their day and please make suggestions um, in the comments for future episodes if you would like to see more. Thank you so much and cheers.